Uh, good evening. Good evening, everybody. Thank you. Thank you all for coming in. It's very good to see uh, a lot of kind of fresh faces, a lot of non-AA people. That's, that's, we're very happy with that. Um, first of all, can I ask you to uh, turn off your mobile phones? Um, and then before I introduce uh, tonight's speakers, um, just a small work, a word on the kind of institutional framework of the evening, which is the Public Occasion Agency. Uh, the Public Occasion Agency has been established by Scrap Marshall and myself. We're two diploma students here at the AA. And it's a framework for a kind of self-determining uh, public program. Uh, and the idea is that we are established as an agency, so that's a practice that serves other practices. And we do so by staging events. Um, as part of the kind of institutional enterprise, we publish a preview and a review document of each event, which accumulates into a booklet, which at the end of the year is available at the AA bookshop. So this term we had four events, of which this is the third one. So next week the last event is with Arnold Reindorp, a Dutch sociologist, who will talk about the city as a performance. Uh, tonight we are very happy to introduce to you Metahaven. Uh, Metahaven was founded in 2006 by Vinka Kruk and Daniel van der Velden. Both graduated from the Willem de Koning Academy in Rotterdam and have conducted research at the Jan van Eyck Academy in Maastricht. Daniel and Vinka joined forces after initiating the Sealand Identity Project at the Jan van Eyck in 2003, which inspired them to found Metahaven, which is a studio combining design, research, and writing. Um, I'm not going to sum up all the works that Metahaven has done, because I think the, the kind of majority of the audience is quite familiar with the work. Um, last thing I'll say is, um, Daniel and Finca uh, are not going to do a straightforward lecture. They're going to introduce the format for the evening, uh, but we would encourage you to uh, participate. So feel free to speak up when you, you feel that's necessary. Right. Uh, so please join me in welcoming to the AA Meta Haven. All right, thank you. Thanks for coming. Uh, yes, so um, what we're going to do is we're going to ask each other a bunch of questions, which are, I mean, we've had each other have a look at these questions, uh, but not a thorough look. So there might be some uh, surprises for, uh, in, st in store for, uh, for, uh, for either of us. Um, and we, while preparing this, we, we realized that, that what it all came down to was some, some sort of um, assessment of the idea of identity in the state uh, with a very, wide, um, a, a very wide understanding of what a state could be and a very wide understanding of what an identity could be. So uh, we're, we're graphic designers, uh, trained, trained, not born as graphic designers, but, but trained as graphic designers. And um, yeah, I think we, we, we are, you know, enjoying our, our, our very, uh, very uh, com complicated relationship with that field since, since some time already. Um, and, and the questions that we have for each other I on, in this context might also reflect this difficult relationship with, with, with graphic design. Um, so without much further ado, I mean, there will be images all also, and, and the set of images will be very constrained um, uh, it will be mainly images from our book, but hopefully for the people who haven't read the book, it's still interesting, and for the people who have read it, it's not a repetition of the book, hopefully. So, it started so now. Daniel. Hi. Hi. Um, so, we run a studio for design um, with a special interest in identity, um, as we say ourselves. Um, but there seems to be a lot of confusion between using the, um, the terminology of identity and brand. Could you explain a little bit about the difference between the two? Yes. Um, if, you, if you talk about an identity, uh, you usually talk about 
aspects of an organization or the visual uh, repertoire of an organization that are very constant, like a logo or colors or something, like things that are really, you know, part that are usually also made by, by designers. And a brand, as opposed to an identity, uh, this is kind of much wider set of qualities that an organization um, uh, 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 has in the perception of a public. For example, if you talk about uh, the way Steve Jobs dresses when he's presenting the new iPad, uh, that, that the way that he dresses then is not part of the Apple identity, but is definitely part of the Apple brand. So an identity is a very constrained set of, uh, let's say, almost visual problems that, that are solved by, by designers usually. Uh, and a brand is, is actually everything that, ev that, that there is to see about an organization. Um, that's basically the difference. Yeah, so if you, if you change an identity, you don't necessarily change the brand. Okay. Yeah? That's okay for now. We'll see where we end up. Can I have that? Yeah? Are you doing this side? Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, so um, okay, I'm going to ask you a question back, actually. Um, what is on corporate identity? The name of the book, and it's shown on the slide here. But maybe it's it's a term that that, that deserves some explanation. I think. Um, I think in order um, to explain what uncorporate identity is, we, I should speak a little bit about what we um, consider to be corporate identity. Um, corporate identity refers to an identity that represents a body, because the the word corporate comes from the Greek, Greek word corpus, which means body. So it's a Latin word, actually. But oh, sorry. Yeah. Well, I wasn't born. Pardon. <laughs> um, correct me. I mean, feel free to interrupt and correct me at any time uh, if you uh, disagree with anything I'm saying, <laughs> too. Okay, sorry about um, that. So corporate identity um, represents um, a body, which could be a body of um, a number of things. and. Um, I think we've always associated corporate identity with the representation of um, commercial or uh, non-commercial organizations because they are very complex and they need some form of representation. Like a company would need a, a logo, for instance, to represent all the people working um, in that company. Um, so that's a single image that represents a whole group of diverse people. Or issues. Or issues. Activities. Okay. Um, so, uncorporate identity um, is a term we came up with. Um, I think it was even you who came up with it. Okay. Um, in 2005. Okay. Um, and for us, it became a term to describe um, of examples of corporate identity where we've um, found there is a um, there is something wrong. There is something strange going on between the representation of this bo of this body and what is considered to be this body. Okay. So the f um, the uncorporate identity has become kind of uh, a terminology for us to kind of speak about um, examples we found in in identity and um, and politics. Okay, so and what do you think about uh, corporate identity? What is your? Well, that was the, this was the question, right? Oh yeah, true. Okay, and this is the body. It's true. Do you want to say something? About yeah. Well, this explains actually what you what you said just said, but in slightly more political terms, because this is the cover image of Thomas Hobbes' uh, uh, famous book uh, *Leviathan*, uh, and this is um, well marked as a kind of beginning of modern political philosophy. And, 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 and Thomas Hobbes wasn't a great Democrat. He believed that there should be one leader who should actually prevent people, his leadership should prevent people from like falling back in what he called the state of nature, where people would fight each other. So as it were, all these people were united in this one image of the ruler, the, the, the Leviathan, right? So you could call this a kind of corporate identity image, an early, an early version of it. And a more political version. Kind of, and which also exposes the kind of political side of it, I guess. So, 
what do you think of corporate identity? As a designer, I mean, you must have a relation with it. So I'm just speaking for myself, right? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, please. Um, I have quite an, um, an ambiguous relationship with corporate identity. On the one hand, I find it um, very scary, and I'm highly suspicious of it. Um, but on the other hand, I'm also fascinated by the fact that um, logos that come out of, um, that are considered to be corporate logos, look very, very simple, but are implemented on a, on a scale that I find that, that is very big. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm interested in the kind of, the, the simplicity of the aesthetic that a lot of these logos have, but at the same time, they're, um, the, the power that they have because they're implemented on, on such large scale. They have more power than, they have, have an enormous impact, you would say, right, okay. Okay, so but an ambiguous relationship is not really an answer to the, to the question, right? Because it, me it means that you have mixed feelings about corporate Yes, identity. so um, on the one hand I okay. find it fascinating, on the other hand I'm also highly suspicious of it. Okay, okay. So there's some sort of power is harnessed in this corporate identity issue. Um, okay, great. But I think I'm returning the question to, to you, too. Yeah. What do you think of, cor of corporate identity? <laughs> well, okay. Well, I, have the, I, I think I have the, um, the also a problem, yeah, kind of, uh, kind of uh, antagonistic relationship with it because you feel that, uh, in a way, many, many things of the, that, that are canonic in design are uh, design, like examples from design history have been examples of identities, logos, uh, trademarks, whatever, that have you know, written graphic design history. Uh, on the other hand, you also feel that this tradition uh, where you could actually talk in very simple terms about what an organization is, are th those this, this time is actually ending now. So you talk about, when you talk about network organizations, when you talk about all kinds of organizations which are more, much more based on kind of voluntary subscription rather than like things like lifetime employment or whatever, you know, referring to like a factory or something. I think that all those things are shifting and that makes, means that the design outcomes are shifting too. And that's, I'm, I'm su super interested in that. But the, I'm antagonistic to the designer who's coming in and saying like, okay, here, I'm gonna design your identity, who's basically taking that identity as it exists in a kind of graphic, you know, way to be the to be the identity. That's uh, what I'm ca actually kind of kind of against, almost. Yeah. So. So, in on corporate identity, we speak a lot about politics and give examples of political um, references and mm -hmm. situations, but. Do you think there's a single position, po single political position we take as authors? Well, I don't think so. In uncorporate identity. I don't think so. I, I, I think I don't, I don't know if you would agree with that, but I don't think there's a consistent political position in the book, behind the book, and I don't know if people have been looking for that sort of position, but it's not there. Uh, but there is a consistent position in terms of the antagonistic relation to the corporate. There is like a, a kind of constant politics in terms of like politicizing or antagonizing on, um, corporate identity and branding. Uh, they are like fired at, questioned, turn, turned inside out, unmasked. They are like debunked. So there is a, a political position that is in the design, in the design position, definitely. And how would you call that position? Um, um, a kind of rebellious position, I would say. The position of the rebel. The position of the, 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 the person or the maker who doesn't subscribe to the, to the standing rules but tries to change them. And there's an, a certain risk to, and a naive to that position as well, of course. Especially now, you know. Why now? Because where um, the the idea 
I mean, it makes me think of, uh, of something they recently said about Julian Assange, the, the, the founder of WikiLeaks, who, 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 who they said like, is um, posting all these documents, bringing them out into the world, hoping for a counterculture that will sort of find it appalling what they find there and will start a kind of you know, a revolution of, that's built on, on a political consent coming from a counterculture. Uh, and I think the belief in, a, in the idea of a counter, uh, something that counters, is in, a, in some ways is a kind of quaint idea because there is not much evidence that these sort of, that a counter movement is actually about to sort of take over. And if you talk, talk about this as a kind of counter movement in design, then that is of course also a kind of um, partially naive idea. But nevertheless, it's worth doing, I think. Well, let's not keep keep hanging okay. here like too long, right? Because I mean, we could talk about that for for much longer, right? Yeah. So there, um, twenty years ago, there was another book written called "Corporate Identity" by Wally Olin. Is uncorporate identity in any way a kind of reaction to that book? Also, because it came out twenty years, ex almost exactly twenty years later. Yeah. The title's quite similar. Was there any reference to that specifically? Well, I mean, in terms of title, I mean, this is a, a slide coming from a guy who, who teaches a branding course, and he's, he's, this is the kind of the reading list. So it, it is funny that we have used exactly the same font as, as Wally Olin's did. Was in the spine, or, or almost the same font. Uh, but was that a conscious decision? No, that was not a conscious decision. How can you say that? How can you convince an audience of that when you have that? I think there's no, ab absolutely no trouble convincing an audience of that because sort of I, thing. Because, because that sort of thing happens all the time. We think there's, an, uh, there's a kind of hidden hand, but it's more an invisible hand, right? It's like, this is how, how things went, how things became. Anyway, but to talk about the dialogue with Wally Olins, right? I just want to confirm that we really didn't know yeah. this book yeah. or this book yeah. company. Anyway. Um, I think there was a dialogue, but it was came from one side because Wally Owens didn't answer. So, so there was, was no, it was, was a kind of monolo monological dialogue or something. Mm. Yeah. Okay, let's move on. Yeah. So in Uncorporate Identity, and especially in the first chapter, um, the principality of Sealand is compared to vague or pseudo countries such as the Transnistrian Moldovian Republic um, and geog geographer Vladimir Kolosov wrote an essay about it. Could you describe this country or these countries? Okay, so, so we, we investigated the, the country, uh, um, uh, this Transnistrian Republic. Uh, 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 the, the reason we did it was because we were working on Sealand. Um, and then actually Kolosov's uh, essay is the longest essay in the book. And he's a Russian, he's a Moscow-based geographer uh, who specializes in these kind of breakaway regions because like um, the Transnistrian Republic, or also called TMR, is a thin strip of land between Moldova and the Ukraine that is a kind of breakaway uh, region from Moldova. So um, they, they utilize in their, in their visual, I mean, if you would go there to their, to their head, to their capital, this is this is um, the the map of of the Transnistrian Republic. Uh, if you go there, you'd see that there's this weird combination of uh, an anachronistic style in time icons, which they still use and they've actually reused. They actually kind of repurposed these type of images for for their own republic. And at the same time, this kind of postmodern market strategy, which includes the sheriff soccer team, of which you see the stadium here and a supermarket chain, uh, uh, which represent at the same time this kind of idea of an eternal homeland and local trafficking and money laundering superpower. So there are actually both. And uh, I, th I think we're, we're really interested uh, in the idea of, a, of, um, of this being a kind of design gesture of some kind. What would be the design gesture? The, because the, um, I mean, design has almost has a kind of legitimizing 
role for both Sealand and the um, Transnistrian Moldovan Republic, even though they're very different from each other. Right. I mean, Sealand was started as a um, um, kind of pirate radio station in the in the late 60s and yeah. became a data haven in the in the 90s, hosting information that could not be hosted yeah. on servers anywhere else in the world. While um, the Transnistrian Moldovan Republic has a very complex history and was part of sure, sure. other yeah, yeah. countries. So what what um, what role does design play here? Where, do, where well, does design maybe the, maybe the, the design comes in not so much in the kind of visual, but it comes in in the fact that there are states. So the state as a kind of form or as a kind of format, actually not my words, but those of Marina Vishmit, uh, who wrote for the book as well. Who's sitting over sitting there. Here, sitting here, sitting somewhere in the audience. Um, the, the state form is the kind of design template for legitimacy. So if you have a state or something that comes from a state or refers to a state, you have more legitimacy. And maybe that's what connects these examples, not maybe their icons or whatever. The design gesture is in the formation of a state or seeming to appear like one or referring to one. Yeah? Well, I think you just answered Yeah, that's, that's dealt with, yeah. Yeah, yeah so this is uh, Marina's uh, text which stretches over two chapters, ch stretches over the whole book actually. And to the left is an advertisement for the Principality of Sealand that we made, as you know. <laughs> but maybe they don't know, right? Okay. And what does it advertise Sealand as? It advertises Sealand as, as a legal black hole. So it's a place, uh, a, kind of a, kind of, a kind of Guantanamo Bay-like site. Where state of exception. Yeah, a state of exception. So quote from Vladimir Kolosov, the stability of unrecognized states is not so much their success story, but a result of their failure of their mother state. And the, my question would be if the pseudo states that he mentions have been born um, out of former Soviet states, but in the case of Sealand, the Principality of Sealand, who has its origins in Britain, its problems are quite different. If Britain is Sealand's mother, what failure of Britain caused Sealand to be able to exist? Well, I, d I don't think that Sealand is comparable to the other examples uh, in the same way because there is territory, but there's no population. So Sealand doesn't have inhabitants. Yeah? So there's no, there's no political community in Sealand who can decide things or can even change Sealand. So, so actually, that, that makes uh, Sealand. Uh, useful as a, as a kind of testing ground for an idea, but it cannot be uh, the home base of a political community, right? So because there is no population, it is o only useful as a kind of state form, as a kind of design shell. But like with, with the Sealand passport, as you can see here, there were Sealand passports issued in the past and recognized as travel documents, uh, but the passports exist, but not the community. So in that way, there's a big difference between these breakaway states and Sealand. Because these breakaway states don't not only use the state form, but they also have a political community, however you know, free or unfree that community is. And Sealand doesn't have a political community. It's a pure testing ground. It's like a lab for a state rather than a state so a laboratory. So Sealand is only design? Yeah, it's only design, yeah like a little piece of land in the sea that is, you know, the zero point of a state, but without people on it, or maybe one or two people, but not that many. So one of the, um, um, when Sealand became interesting for us in the, um, when it started this data haven, um, Sean Hastings, a hacker from the US, um, an internet entrepreneur, has said in an interview that's also in the book, um, free data flow is one of the cornerstones of freedom. But once we've, so my question to you would be, once we've gained this freedom, what do we end up doing with it? Yeah. But that, that's, it's important whether that's a question for, for, for us or for Hastings, right? 
because for Hastings, for someone like Sean Hastings, uh, yeah, the rise and fall of the data haven, uh, for, for him, freedom is not a, a means but an end in itself, you know? It's like this idea of negative freedom, the idea of freedom as a condition, you know? You are free from rather than free for, like you're, you're free from like influence, uh, power by others. He's this typical kind of typical anti-government or minimal government entrepreneur type. He's basically a kind of Sarah Palin uh, well, of I sea mean, land. But on the other hand, you know, Sean Hastings, I think he's a, he's a traditional anarchist because he, he rejects any form of political representation. Yeah, but that's also the problem, right? Like the fact that you have a, a, a kind of essentially a kind of neoliberal position that is kind of at the same time and also has an affiliation with anarchism, which is basically why you know people can, who are actually ultra conservative can easily pose as libertarians. And there's a kind of uh, like he, he advocates the use of arms, for example. He says, you know, we need to have arms in order to defend, and then you know you can fill it in our property, which is basically his property, right? So I, I think it's it's he he d really defines this kind of paradox of the of the Palin Palinesque uh, <laughs> contemporary as a hacker again. So then that makes it more complicated even. Okay, let's move yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, let's let's. Okay, w where are we going from here? What are these? Those. Yeah. They're stamps. Stamps. Real stamps or? No, they're proposals. Just stamp stamps. Proposals. Okay. What's this stamp? <laughs> um, this is, um, oh, what, what do you call this? Kind of looks like a certificate yes, it's to a me. Yeah. So this was, um, uh, okay, I have to remember what, how, how, we, got, how we got this. Um, I think you met someone in the US at some point who knew someone who had a Sealand citizenship certificate. No, no, more like a noble, oh, looks a noble like a noble title anyway. Noble title. Okay, so this is a noble title. Yeah. But which he got from the internet probably. No, it was handed to her, right? Yeah, like a p as a gift. Yeah. Oops. Yeah. Okay. All right. So there's some more Sealand stuff. So another example mentioned in the book on corporate identity is the House of People in Bucharest, Romania. Uh, built by an overthrown leader, it now rests as an empty symbol. The ideology disappeared with the revolution, but the building itself cannot be hidden. A well-known strategy is to turn buildings with problems into tourist attractions. What's your, what's your take on this? Um, the, well maybe I should say a bit about why this is in the book in the first place. The, um, it's the first project of the, um, which is in the second chapter of the book, in which we compare which we speak about on corporate identity as a, um, well, we try and find examples of uncorporate identity where there's a difference between the, the ideology that um, contrib um, contributed to um, the existence of logos or representation and the way that it is actually represented today. And this is a good example of it because, because it was, um, it's a, one of the biggest buildings in the world was built by the dictator Nicolae Ceausescu, and the, um, after the um, revolution of 89, it was turned into a museum for contemporary art, as well as a lot of other things. Um, so it's become, a, um, it's been used as a, as a way, to, well, people in Bucharest didn't really know what to do with it, because it's too big to, to demolish or, or to hide, and on the, but on the other hand, it doesn't uh, represent the same ideology that it used to present when it was originally constructed. Um, so it's been used, um, a lot of tourism has been at, um, attracted to this, to this building in order to kind of avoid the discussion about it. Yeah, but what's design about? Why, why is it in the book eventually? Why do you as a graphic designer, why are you interested in this? I mean, I'm interested in this because it's, um, I s we, we, well, I consider it to be a, a 
like a three-dimensional logo. I think it works with the same um, um, the the same uh, restrictions and possibilities of representations as a logo does. Okay. So one of the things we came up with to kind of deal with this building was to undo it of a cemetery because this cemetery is a very big characteristic of this type of architecture. Um, so would be take away a part of the building. And thereby you kind of undo the totalitarian effect. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So this is like the realm of buildings is now definitely behind us. We're going to go to talk a little bit about tourists and borders. So, so far we have discussed uh, the state um, as a design of legitimacy, but how do you design attraction? How do you design an attractive state, like a place that tourists would want to visit? I think in order to um, design attraction, you have to manipulate the truth. Mm -hmm. Tweak the, tr the truth. Um, and if you go to the next slide, I think we see why. Because this is an example of all the um, tourist logos that are used for by countries in Europe, which are all inspired by um, this very famous um, logo, which was designed by Jean Miro for Spain, which we showed previously. Um, and with manipulating manipulating the truth in this case I mean that all these countries copy the aesthetics or kind of handwriting the kind of Mediterranean kind of feel of this Espana logo even if they're not geographically even close to the Mediterranean um, shall we go back to that logo once more yeah. so we have the me here okay so Poland or even the Netherlands would not you know, they okay, don't so attraction means Mediterranean. If, if it has to be attractive, it has to look med Mediterranean. In the case of tourist logos, yes, we can okay. see that here. Yeah. But there, there seems to be something else going on, these logos. Like, you think, you look at their colors, you think, you know, um, what, what's about these, you know, aesthetics? There's like, okay, Miro was an artist, but these logos are not designed by artists. These, these logos look like they've been designed by managers. Right? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Is there a question coming? No, I mean, do you agree? I agree. Okay. <laughs> uh, then, then maybe just what is it that makes red, blue, yellow, and green so different, so appealing? Well, if you go to the next slide, there seems to be kind of interest in showing and kind of including the full color spectrum right in these logos which is a similarity between you know the the tourist logos that we saw before and these the identity for El Salvador Windows Google and even the logo that's supposed to show diversity for the European Union which is so it's a together. shorthand for for the all inclusive yes Um, but maybe it's interesting to speak a little bit about another form of branding um, of states because the, um, these tourist logos are supposed to communicate something very positive um, for Europe especially. But on, if we, but on the other hand, there's also a form of negative branding going on, which is this, um, there are these campaigns initiated by Switzerland and Spain which brand Europe in a very different way abroad. They are, um, these are screenshots from, from clips that are shown in Africa to, prov to um, well, to communicate to possible migrants con um, thinking of coming to Europe to, um, how do you, what do you say? I'm, I lost the word. I, d I don't, I'm not sure what you're going to say, so like. I'm the interviewer. Um, 
to discourage them. To discourage people to migrate. Yes, exactly. Okay. That was so this is a kind of this is very connected to what we just saw, but in a different with a very different value. Yeah, so this is a negative. This is a, a negative way of of branding Europe, while the tourist brands are a positive way of branding okay. Europe. Okay. Okay. So these discourage people from coming here, while the other brands are supposed to encourage people to come and visit. A different audience then. Tur tourists versus tu migrants. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So these seem to be some spreads from the book that actually also show some of our posters. So there is a, a lot of talk about borders in the book. What do you what do you think? This is uh, not so much about the book, but more. Wh what do you think about this kind of discussion about borders, as, as it as it takes place, like recently and like during many years already, like the academic discussion about borders. Well, we've always been, I've always been interested in the way that um, um, borders are also um, produced, maybe not by physically putting up a wall or a border, but um, cr by um, creating difference, maybe even by speaking about um, subjects in a certain way. So for instance, um, the way that we would um, speak about Europe um, or would um, define Europe even um, excludes some people. Um, so in the language which is used to, to speak about Europe, um, there are countries and people excluded from it. Mm -hmm. um, what you're showing here is um, a monopoly game we we designed, um, which is a representation of the city of Paris, um, and we were interested in kind of making a a visual representation of the city which emphasizes the border. Um, there's a very difficult relation between Paris and its outskirts, um, and this is a kind of way for us to speak about it. To visualize it. To visualize okay. it. So it looks almost like a kind of arena, a kind of dystopian uh, arena of a kind of massive scale. So it's clearly a model. Because this yeah, can so never be built. No, but you could play it if, you, if we would have, we, we could print it and you could play it. Okay. But it, it now only exists as a model. Okay. So it's a kind of, it, it, uh, by playing the game, you you affirm the um, the, um, the border around the city center, mm. and all the all the names of the streets and all the um, iconographic references all come from the discussion be of the relation between the center of Paris and its outskirts. Okay. So. To put to use what we've mentioned so far um, in a few of the projects that we've mm -hmm. been speaking about, um, it seems we need to understand today's power relations and predict where design comes in. Um, in the book, we mention a thing called soft power, the power of attraction and influence. Could you explain? Um, yes. Um. Yeah, maybe, I mean, it shouldn't become like so a too long of a sort of, you know, story about that idea of soft power. Basically, um, there has been a lot of thought about different, about types of power that don't use, uh, let's say, force or like, uh, like threat to um, make you do something. So if I, if I want to make you do something, I can, you know, I can force you, you know, threaten you, get out a sword or something, and then you'll do it. But I can also try well, and change your... <laughs> or I fight back. Yeah, fight back, sure. But then we have a, a visible conflict, an observable... We have an observable conflict then, right? So that would be from a hard wait, power. Yeah, that, that would be hard power. Mm -hmm. But I can also, um, let's say, frame your desires and, and future wishes in such a way that you want the thing that I want you to do. So you'll change your you'll change your mind without you knowing that I I did that you know I, I like I, I influenced that and that's like a, that's a major part of what soft power is. Could you give an example? Well, I mean, um, yes, I mean the way that the United States, for example, which is the natural sees itself as the natural 
uh, guardian of soft power, has operated this international image for, for, for decades, has been by presenting the world with, you know, culture, movies, uh, like com uh, consumer culture, Hollywood movies, all kinds of cultural forms that actually uh, influence people's expectations and wishes and, 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 and desires about what they want to be in the world without any force being observably, without observable conflict. So there no. is, might be a conflict, there might also be uh, antagonism, but it's not observable in this, uh, you know, uh, soft power thing. So it's a form of persuasion. Yeah, it's persuasion. Now, and now branding is something that has very little political, um, there's no solid political grounding for branding anywhere to be found in like political theory, wherever. The only grounding that it has is in this idea of soft power. So that's why we've started to, to, to think from soft power, actually take that concept seriously and see if it actually... But wait, wait yeah. because it seems to me like, okay, hard power we know from the, w the war and kind of what came after that. And then it seems that soft power would have been something that started to flourish in the late 70s, 80s, 90s, 80s. But I mean, that's some time ago. Well, yeah. But it's still, I mean, it, people still hope that the, the, the soft power dream, you know, will catch on again. I mean, that's what Obama's trying to do when he's traveling abroad and like t talking about uh, presenting the US, you know, actually going to all kinds of countries where he tries to create a dialogue. It's actually trying to, to, to regain that moment, that, so that American soft power moment, not knowing if that will ever come back in, in, you know, in the way that he or it, that, that his administration <laughs> desires it. But let, let, let's talk about design a little bit because we're wandering off here into uncertain ground. So like uh, we've been, we've written, uh, this is an article from the book about soft power. Uh, and in it, we also encountered this idea of network power, which is a, a much more solid, uh, much more defined concept of power uh, in terms of the fact that it's about the subscription to a network standard. So branding, if you talk about nation branding, for example, you could see that as nothing else than joining a certain standard, joining a certain protocol of how to do things. It's nothing more than that. And that the fact that you've joined that standard makes the things that you exchange um, via the standard have a much wider reach. So, you know, because there has been the perpetual question, why if branding is all about creating difference, why do all the brands look the same? This has always been like a question haunting design. And the answer is because it's a standard. It's not about creating difference. It's, a, it's about creating similarity. And that's basically what the article uh, tries to address in a kind of playful, so you uh, say with visual the, way. With a world that has become more globalized, we've come become more dependent on standards? Yeah, inherently. Inherently, standards are more dominant. But then what's the relation between standards and network power? Like the idea is that in order to have a network, you need to have a networking standard. So you need to have a protocol by which you can exchange, you know, goods, information uh, through the network. Like a container, for example, like a shipping container is a form of, an, of, a, of a standard unit that functions in a product, in a kind of network protocol. Because the containers can then move around the world exactly, to different, exactly. to different yeah. harbors. So there's so wait, wait, no wait, principal wait. difference between a brand and a container. So it would be... Would English also be a standard? Yeah, also. Yeah, so any be language. Because we have agreed to not speak Dutch tonight, but to speak English. Yeah, I mean that. So we all understand each other, hopefully. Yeah. So that would create a network because we would agree to the standard that we all speak English tonight together. Mm -hmm. Which excludes those people who, who don't speak English or those people who want to def defend another protocol like French. So it's like. Okay, so it's join or die. You either mm, more or less. I mean, at some point, this is what this guy, David Grewell, is arguing, who we interviewed, uh, <laughs> as you know. Um, he he, he uh, basically says there is like a, a form of coercion in this network, uh, idea of network power, because you might, you know, you might end up in a situation where you, you have no real choice but like joining Facebook or something. Like so in a world where everything goes on Facebook, the, the choice whether to, whether or not to go on Facebook is actually in the end no longer a free choice. 
even though you do it voluntarily. So where does design come in with designing standards? Oh, I don't well, know. either well, is there is there such a thing as designing standards? Uh, well, this was. Or do they just exist? Yeah, this was a proposal for uh, the network standard of the uh, of the of the network of the internet suffix, like the thing that comes after the dot, like the dot com, basically. This was a pr design proposal that we did around like opening up that, opening up that standard. So you would have dot UK yeah. or dot So you're actually, you're, you're totally transparent about the fact there's nothing, there's no difference, there's no real difference to what you're creating as a brand because it's be it comes as the suffix. So like dot ghost or dot face or whatever, this would be in a, a way to, to do that. And uh, okay, this is like a lost, lost slide, that's weird. Anyway, we'll skip that. This is, uh, so this is actually, this is what would happen if the, the internet protocol come, opens up to different uh, character sets, not just the text that's in the page, but also in the address bar. And then you could, get, you could create all kinds of new confusions and new uh, strategies of um, counter, like counter strategies almost. So you could compose a .NET out of three different languages, uh, writing, writing sets, you know, it could, and it could, you know, that could relate to cyber crime, et cetera, et cetera. So standards are always designed. There is a negative brand. You just said that with the tourist stuff. Yeah, so it's about designing yeah. deterrence. That yeah. was also the word I was looking for. Yeah. Attraction <laughs> versus deterrence. Yeah. So this is another set of standards that we, we, we talk about in the book. It's more related to the urban fabric and the idea of seeing Europe as some sort of a place that is somehow slightly um, becoming more similar in terms of certain urban developments and brands that you see turning up in, in neighborhoods and that we really like and we are really interested in. The idea of the, of the phone house and the idea of the, the, the yeah, certain standardized form of you know, shop or store that you see turn up. So if something is standardized, does it need to be centrally controlled? So is someone no, checking no. the standard? No, there's no more central control with the standard. Someone designed the standard and then that person can kind of go away and the standard will live. Even though it does pr produce a form of network? S because it produces a form of network, right? So you say that there's a, the, um, the example of the kind of mini markets, internet places, there are standard but no one, but they can, and they exist as a standard because no one is checking whether they comply with the standard. Well, they, no one knows who, cr who cre created that standard in that particular form, but there's a kind of protocol that they join that I think we've created some. So uh, who's this friend? Uh, which friend? There's lost to the logo friend and then it's signed oh, yeah. by friend. Okay, oh yeah, that's a set of letters that, that are part of the, the book and that we've written and they're, they're they're written by friend and they're addressed to a f another friend. So they're, they're letters, basically. Will the design standards eventually replace all other design? What do you think? Well, if we just discuss the fact that um, standards are de may be designed, if they're, I mean, Facebook is obviously <coughs> a design standard, right? but the language of English is not, um, then maybe not all, uh, we cannot speak about all standards as, as being designed in the first place, but that they sometimes exist <coughs> more as a protocol so that's something that we ag all agree to by practicing it rather mm -hmm. than using it as, a, as something that has been designed for us. But for, for example, like in user-generated content, like you're, you're, you're working with a standard, like you're, you're putting stuff on YouTube, for example. The standard and the, 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 the website, like the YouTube protocol has been designed. There's absolutely no question about that. You can't change a thing about it. It's been designed for you. Whatever you put on it is kind of your choice, right? So you, you, if you would, you know, if you put like your stuff on YouTube, you're actually participating in a much bigger, you know, sort of design and then you could argue that I indeed you know maybe the design of standards uh, will replace not replace all other forms of design 
but it will kind of ground all other forms of design. It will sort of be the condition upon which we design. I mean, we've just changed our website because of this question, right? Which was basically that this, the site didn't work on an iPhone. It, you know, it, it did all kinds of, violated the, the user's uh, pop-up settings, etc. So we've changed it into something that looks sort of vaguely Web 2.0-ish. Uh, that at least doesn't do that. So we've complied with the standard. So in, so in some ways we've like designed on top of the standard, I would say. So there is a kind of compliance there. So how then does it work with power and standards? Because in the, in, on something like Facebook or YouTube, the thing that has the most power is the thing that most people would agree with, right? Mm -hmm. So something that's the voted for most. Yeah on YouTube will have the most power. Mm -hmm. But what's the question? The question would be, how does that relate to, um, to hierarchy, for instance? Or uh, relate to uh, a power like hard power where there is a form of mm. well, yeah. hierarchy? Mm -hmm. It's a bit of a Yeah, OK, let's, let's just move on for now. Uh, maybe we can come, 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 come back to that. Yeah, but sure. it's yeah. So, what are your dreams for the future? Um, what's it? M maybe something that came from the future. <laughs> Now, this is something, uh, you know what this is, because this is uh, one of the stickers we designed for a fruit uh, distribution project as part of uh, Manifesta 8 in Spain. And this is the sticker that we designed for the ecological collective called the Agri Agriculturas, the Musia. Uh, and this is the st one of the stickers they put on their fruit. So. I think we're, we were always interested in the idea of the micro, the micro, micro, the very small, right? And that, that this is definitely something small, although now it's big. So in terms of dreams for the future, anything to be said about this? Well, here we were kind of, well, we've been interested in currencies lately a lot. Um, and what and how diff and how different um, different things like m maybe our friends on Facebook or um, any form of social relation produced through a network could essentially become maybe a currency. And this um, this fruit sticker kind of anticipates on that because it um, it predicts that you know the the fruit that, that we exchange or the fact that we exchange something which could, which could be fruit could potentially become a currency as well. Right. Um, a negative currency in this case because it says bribe. So it would be used as a. But that's so positive, right? A bribe even. Could be positive. Yeah, advanced form of, advanced form of money. So, but it says future currency. So it's a proposal in a way for a currency. So a rumor is also a currency? Yes, because in um, Or a favor? Because in a, in, a, in a context where we operate, um, if in, in a context which is essentially social and we have relations to each other, the, um, the way that we interact with each other is the currency. So for instance, th this actually comes from looking at the way tribes work. Um, and how um, value is created within such a thing as a tribe where you, know, you do a favor for someone but then you have to return it essentially. Um, mm. So a, a, a rumor would be like a way to kind of influence um, that social relation and also the, um, the reputation of, uh, of people within that group. Right. So a gift and you're obliged to return it. Yes. Or at least it, giving something to someone 
creates an expectation of return, which you could think about how that could be monetized. So in terms of dreams for the future, I think I'm kind of dreaming about what that is going to turn into. As a design project? Yes. Okay. So what are your dreams for the future? Um, well, there, I think there, there's overlaps between our dreams in terms of what we, what we might do in the future. Um, maybe it's good to show some, some more like concrete before we start to look into the glass sphere, you know, and then look, looking into the future. Uh, look at this uh, thing that we did for, for Icon. Uh, because now, I mean, yesterday we were at Goldsmith and there were big uh, demonstrations going on about uh, the reforms here in the UK, the governmental reforms. <laughs> And uh, a while ago, we were asked by Icon to make a contribution for their, for their pages. And we, decide, we decided to talk about rebranding Britain um, and the big society. The idea of what, what is David Cameron and, and Nick Clegg, what are they up to? Uh, and the page that came before this, which we have, don't show here, said from cool Britannia to cold Britannia. So it played on, and that's why there's also the icy, this icy colors and then the bubbles at the same time, you know, because the bubbles talk about, you know, dangerous utopian visions. Um, so the thing that we, we thought about, and this is, I think it's very close to, the, to what we're, we're gonna do, what I hope, I, a dream we will do in the future, is going further with this idea of a, uh, an, an assessment of social media and politics as a site of uh, a set of um, um, ca comedy slash tragedy in that order. And this is basically the dream of, of is if you realize that the Encyclopedia Britannic Britannica is like an age old, uh, you know, institution with a, with a clearly, with a clear gatekeeping function. What, what basically what, 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 what the conservatives are doing, have been proposing since their campaign, is to combine that basically conservative sense of status with something that is actually kind of crowdsourced. So what they hope for is a Wikipedia Britannica. That's what they dream of. And the same for Britter, the idea of, you know, that now also in, in, these kind, in the kind of housing estates of Leeds, we can, you know, be connected to the whole world because we have Twitter. You know, you, you have this idea of Britter. Um, and then we, we thought, because there's a big think tank culture in, in the UK too, what are the think tank reports of the future going to look like? So they're going to look like they're going to start with crowdsourcing democracy and they're going to end with the rise of the antisocial class. Why the well-connected live longer, negative citizenship, you know? So there's the, 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 kind, of co the kind of coercive or f even violent side of, that, of, the, of the reforms is going gonna, gonna to probably show up in some way, you know, in the way that intellectuals talk about this in a kind of policy think tank context and then ultimately what is more British than the poster for the Sex Pistols Anarchy in the UK tour but now it's being done by the conservatives right with Facebook Twitter YouTube and Flickr as the kind of star bands you know so there this comes back to your question about the anarchist dreams of, uh, of Sean Hastings uh, there there is a we have now a full circle of, of conservatism and pro, pro, like uh, uh, pro, uh, pro progressive uh, <coughs> thinking, conservatism, progressivism, we have it full circle now. Yeah, so that's, that's basically something that would require further thought. Dreaming yeah. further yeah. of this. Yeah. And in relation to that, maybe it's good to show one more, like one more thing. Uh, like, because there's, of course, a lot of debate about what Facebook gonna become, you know, the idea of data mining of citizens. And this is what, um, yeah, this is actually the body politic contemporary. So it's, this is Mark Zuckerberg and this is, the, this is uh, uh, Hobbes. And this is what uh, Cory Doctorow thought of, like what will happen to the Facebook idea, the idea of a state book, the idea that it will be government, um, which is actually, becoming this kind of perfect data mining uh, organization. But basically here you still see the anti-authoritarian uh, West Coast mentality that's actually against government and seeing basically 
the government as the, as the evil, you know, as the kind of the thing that's bad. Um, so this is what the, the, the assessment from a, from a very renowned science fiction writer is like. I think we, we might have, I might have, we might have the opposite assumption. What we're gonna get is not a, fa a state book, but a face state. Something where you have, uh, you don't need, you have basically something that has a, a Facebook structure but that can function, that takes over parts, partially functions of the state. I mean, we get, we, we, we did like the whole- Like voting. Voting, or, but also uh, policing, maybe. So, Terrorism watch. Yeah, well, maybe, yeah. So this is a kind of um, future uh, project. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Daniel and Vinka, for this uh, interview that was, I think, a wonderful fly through, through the book and the work. Um, questions from the audience? Please. All right, perhaps I can ask one question first. Um, I, I very much like this uh, notion that you talked about oops, uh, of soft power, and you talked uh, about oh, uh, the kind of American example, which is perhaps a global scale. I was wondering if you could talk maybe through design about soft power on an urban scale, whether that might exist. Um, yeah, if, like the, the, the thing is with soft power that you have to, let's say you could say that two, peop two friends in a bar talking, you know, and, and convincing each other of their music taste or something is a form of soft power, but it's not a form of power that is, that is exerted by like someone who is actually in power. So you could say that there's, there's been in the Netherlands, uh, especially a lot of softening measures on the urban scale in terms of art projects, uh, uh, design projects that are supposed to soften the, the impact of, of urban change and to, to actually make it more pretty, and more attractive. And that's, a, that's a, an attempt at soft power by like, you know, agencies who have some sort of power, usually, maybe not much, but they do have some sort of power. And they try to make urban change something fluid and nice. So that's you would say that's a persuasive power? It's, it tries to persuade. I mean, it doesn't, when it doesn't really happen or when it doesn't, you know, they don't succeed, then of course you can question whether they've actually made, you know, whether they really did it or whether it's, but it's, it's definitely an attempt at like soft power on urban scale. Yeah. Thank you. I, I mean, if don't know if people are familiar with these types of projects, I don't know if these so same sort of things are happening here, but yeah. Audience, do you not have one single question or response? You defined branding and identity and corporate design. Do you have a definition for graphic design? <laughs> That's a very hard question. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, well, maybe, maybe it's not. Yeah, maybe it's possible. <laughs> and then we can <laughs> and we can spend like, you know, yeah, we can spend. Um, graphic comes from a printing technique. So it comes from something that is being put on a on a that's being put on a a kind of template, yeah, like like the plate of a printing press, and then it's being uh, it's being transferred to paper. So it comes from a technique, um, and in that sense, it might disappear. The technique or graphic? The word <laughs> the word graphic. I hope not. I mean, let's keep print, but like. In, in like countries where, for example, design is not part of the sort of inherited culture, you see that there's courses, but there's no longer no men there's no more mention of the word graphic. There's maybe communication or visual, but there's design, but there's not graphic design. Do you like the word graphic design? Mm. Well, we, we like tend it? to speak about our work as design because we don't necessarily think that all our work will be printed or is kind of is. Um, even designed from a kind of print perspective. So I think two years ago we decided to kind of skip the word 
graphic. But it keeps somehow coming back. But when we speak about how we were trained, I, I mean, I will always say that I was trained as a graphic designer. Um, yeah. Even though we do a lot of other things for which we were not formally trained. But, but the bio says that we're a studio for critical graphic design. <laughs> so somehow it hasn't disappeared. With we yeah. are graphic yeah. designers. So it's, it's part of a, of a reflex, maybe. Maybe we're also proud to be graphic designers in some strange way. <laughs> yeah, because you started off very problematic or kind of positioning of us as a very kind of having a very problematic relation with graphic design. Mm -hmm. Which is why you keep in being interested in it, right? I mean, I wish well, we I had a. I was quite surprised to hear it. Okay, yeah. Maybe, maybe it's not so problematic. W w there's one more question here at the front. I'd like to ask, ask you something about the book. Um, obviously, you made a conscious decision to um, decide in, in, in favor of a format of uh, um, a semi or not quite, or I don't know what, what sort of interview it actually was. But uh, in terms of the book, it, it, it's quite a straight-laced book as such. So it's not too fragmented. It goes for a quite conventional format. Um, so that would be my question. Or in other words, you seem to be quite interested in in various uh, representations of uh, authority, such as certificates, stamps, uh, w w you know, uh, le legal tender. Is, uh, so do you consider um, a sort of conventional book in such a, sin uh, such a thing still a kind of currency to uh, quite effective to, to put out your, if you like, your position into the, um, well, let's say the, the, the word of design discourse? The good thing about a book is that it has um, it has a front and a back, and you can c you can put all kinds of stuff in it. But at, at the moment that it's printed, it's also done. I think before the book existed, a lot of our work was kind of scattered. So it was it would we would speak at a conference about search engines, and the other and the next thing we would do is design a flyer, for instance. Um, and what the book enabled us to do was to kind of think of a kind of red thread through all the projects that we wanted to speak about. So it was a, it w the, the good thing about the format of a book was that we could kind of container all the things that we wanted, that we had been thinking about um, and writing about to put, put them together and to kind of give them a, a beginning and an end. Um, so well, the currency question is, uh, is a really good one, I think. Sorry? The currency aspect is a really good one. I mean, as soon as a book, I mean, a book that's basically our, our, our publisher is someone who has a very solid idea of what a book is. A book is something that you buy and then you put it in, a, in an archive. So he basically says, you know, you have this book, you should not touch it, you put it in an archive and it's there as a kind of, in a kind of bourgeois, you know, in, in a certain, certain type of bourgeois setting. And the nice thing with a, with a book is that, of course, it's not doing that. It's something that's being traded, that people like read, they borrow books from each other. And that is when it still is a currency. You know? It's still something that is uh, so easy to use that it's actually, uh, you can exchange it, you can, uh, you know, you can hold it in your hands. Uh, but whether that we would do something like this another time, that's a different question. You know, we would probably, we're, we're, we're kind of planning an, on a new one, but it would be, we're more concerned now about price, so we would definitely make it cheaper. We would make it smaller, uh, because like the people that, that somehow seem to like or you know like to buy the book do a lot of train reading, so these books get you know they get damaged. So all those are aspects of a, of a currency of a book that that have to be you know considered. But the so book is a currency still. In a sense, I was not really uh, aiming at sort of challenging the validity of books as such or the, the notion of a book. But your take on it, your specific take on it, um, obviously that includes design decisions, but also, I mean, as you, as you say, uh, I don't know, expenses and I don't know, practicalities or, you know, how Yeah, well, travel. as we've learned like our, a little bit our way to like what publishers think and what they, what they want and what we want, you know, of course we start to have opinions about that. Um, I, uh, just if I remember right, uh, when you um, differentiated between brand and identity, you said that 
um, identity is what the designer does and brand is very much more than that. Is that right? Brand is what the audience does, basically. I think it's, uh, my, my objection would be that I think it's the other way around, that the very act of branding is a design act, a, um, a planned act, including Steve Jobs' uh, outfit at the presentations, and that identity is actually a multidimensional dialogue between um, various entities of which branding or the brand itself might be one component. I think then we agree because the Steve Jobs outfit was part of the brand, but it was not part of the identity. But I think you mean identity as a, um, in the terms of house style, right? Like there's a logo and I think maybe you mean identity more something that's in the collective um, awareness, for instance, of people. Something that... Is that what you mean? I'm talking about corporate identity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So an identity that's being formed out of I mean, not only the branding itself, but also perception, the product. But that's um, brand. That's usually, that's what being considered brand. The idea that you, you are in a way, your brand is what other th others think about you, these kinds of, you know, management uh, but truths. It, you know? But if you look at, at it uh, etymologically, um, branding is a very performative act. Of yeah, it's, an like act it's an action, branding. exactly. You brand. But when you identify, you work with what is taken, uh, what is given. Right. But like, uh, if you talk about it from the perspective of.